it's good to be back. Uh, in the middle of COVID, uh, we didn't know when we would be speaking here and there very rarely. And so a wedding up north took us, uh, brought us near here. And so we had an opportunity to visit you the first time in 2020. And now we can come back and see you again and more of you. And uh, we don't have to rush through or anything. We can, we, we've been spending a couple days here. In the meantime, we've gone from being advancing indigenous missions to engage today, as our old name just was uh, getting in our way, you might say. And as we were looking at a new website, and they say the first thing you do is check your logo, check your name, and if you're sure that that's what you're going to do for the next 15 years, then go ahead. So we did end up with a change of name. And it's, it's an interesting one because when you enter it in your computers, it's engage.today. That's all you type in and you will get the website. We work in South Asia and Southeast Asia and have been for about 22 years. Uh, I have been to all the five countries that are our main countries. We did work in Africa for a while, so we're not limited, but depending on who, which partners God gives us, uh, that's where we tend to work. At the table afterwards, I'm gonna encourage you to respond in several ways. Uh, one is we do have cards as well. In our case, uh, there's my card, so you can pray for Elaine and I. There will be three people that I'm gonna talk about and their cards are out there, so you can pray for them. They're each mission leaders in their own right. They each run a mission with different number of, of uh, churches and workers underneath them. And so you can also pray for, or uh, participate in other ways to support them. And just before all these things happened uh, with COVID, we wrote a book and then did the final editing during COVID. And then we waited for our name change so that when we published the book, it would have the right name on it. And so that's available for $20. And it tells a story of two partners, one of which is the second one I'll talk about today. So you get a much fuller look at Philemon's life in the book. It's written about two countries. Today I want to speak out of Luke. And uh, the main passage has been read already. We also are going to be looking at Acts uh, 1. And as we look at those passages, there's different things that I want to emphasize. It's, it's one of those times, if you compare the passages, uh, where you can find that there are differences in time and in uh, detail, but you can also see that the, the scripture is consistent. Luke writes both books, Acts and Luke, and you would hardly find that he would make a mistake in the way he said something, but he does draw off different details. So in these verses, this is just to show you a little bit about how scripture works. Uh, it seems like you got one long day in Luke 24, starting with the ladies at the resurrection and at the end, Jesus is leaving. And we know there's 40 days in between. In fact, Luke tells us in the other passage, there's 40 days in this time period. So we got to think a little bit about when everything happened. And the second thing is in one passage, as they're going to, for Jesus to ascend, they're going toward Bethany. And in the other one, it says they're going to the hills of Gethsemane or the, uh, I got the name wrong. Uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And they're actually in the same direction. So they both are in the direction of Bethany, but they only went to the hill. And so you get those details. So when you're reading scripture and you notice little things like that, it's, it just helps us to think about it so that we realize the different settings. In the actual passage here, um, this follows, like I said, there, there's the, the resurrection, and then it seems like the same, pretty much the same day, there were two men that walked a distance to another town. And all of a sudden, and they were discussing, well, what's been happening? What does it mean? And all of a sudden, Jesus is with them explaining it. And then as they get to their place, they realize who he is finally, and then he disappears. And so they've just walked a couple hours, and it took them a little while to kind of finish the meal and, and get ready, and they walk back. <laughs> And they told the disciples, you wouldn't believe it, but Jesus has appeared to us. And as they're describing this, Jesus is there again, and he's showing them the nails of the hands and things. 
This seems to follow right after that, but we don't know for sure that it's right after or somewhere else in the 40 days. But he says, when I was with you, I told you everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. He's basically saying this Bible that we have, and we know we have the New Testament now, but the whole Old Testament, you know, is all about me and the things that are going to happen in God's kingdom. And he's specific by referring to three different parts that it's, it's the whole thing. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And in the other set of verses, it says that the Holy Spirit led them to understanding. And we know that Jesus, when he was on earth, taught and helped the disciples to understand all about God and what he wanted them to know. But by the other passage emphasizing that the Holy Spirit was involved, we understand that the Spirit is always working at helping us to understand what Jesus is saying. And we'll talk a little bit about the role of the Holy Spirit a little later. And that's one of the things he does. Just as Jesus explained who the Father was and what his words meant, the Holy Spirit helps us as we read those words to understand what he meant and what that means in our life. Now, I want to ask you to think about something to do, to help do this for yourself. You know, sometimes we have the Bible and we don't write in it. We, we read it. But I have learned from another pastor that it's good to scribble in your Bible. Now, scribble used loosely. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it may look quite colored to somebody else who glance at the page, but there should be order for you just to help you understand and so I began marking up my Bible, and I've got yellow for those passages that really need to be looked at again and again, but I've got other ways of marking the, the, the pages, sometimes even, in fact, just an arrow, you know, because you're reading this and you realize, well, the follow-up is over there on that page. But one thing that I think pertains to this statement is I put P for prophecy, when I realize in the Old Testament that something taught about Jesus or taught about something God was to do, I'll put a P. And I use a big P when I know it's about Christ. And then when I see it fulfilled, I'll put a small F for the small P's and a big F for the big P's. And so the New Testament is full of big F's and a few small ones. And sometimes you see um, a fulfillment right within a few verses it's kind of the proof that the rest of what the prophet said is going to come true later. So you have a small f, or a small p, small f, and you have a big P, and somewhere in the New Testament you have the big F. And there is over 350 prophecies in the Old Testament that are fulfilled and noted by the authors of the New Testament after Christ left. That's a lot of detail, and they're very minute. The place where he was born, who would be in that setting, uh, where he would move and live the rest of the life. And so they're going like, how come there's a prophecy about Nazareth and Bethlehem? Well, when you put a story together, you see why. So that is a way to take this and to, it's an affirmation that what Jesus says is true. I don't know of anybody else that has that many said things said up to several thousand years before he was born that all came true in one person. That's one of the big proofs that the Bible is the Word of God, and it's true, and it needs to be listened to. And he says, particularly, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. This was a shocker for the disciples. It, it kind of lists, if you go through Matthew or Mark, and you go like, and Jesus told him this for the first time, and he told him for the second time, and he sold to, to, to them for the third time. And finally, they started understanding. And as we know from these guys in Emmaus, they were still working on understanding that. And he says, guys, these three things that I told you about, do you see how they fulfill? See how it just happened? And here we are. He has just risen from the dead on the third day. The biggest proof that he is God not just a man. I mean, he is a man, but he is also God. He rose from the dead, 
And that's why we can look forward to him raising us when he says he can give us eternal life. Because he proved it in himself. Now it's also written in this message, and this is what we want to spend some time after I'm finished with the text, that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name, Jesus' name, to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins to all who repent. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, that forgiveness and what it means when I tell you the story of Madan later on. But we basically, as believers in 2 Corinthians, it reminds us we're ambassadors sent to ask people to repent so that it can be right with God. This is our message. There is forgiveness of sins if you repent. If you believe in Jesus and the one who sent him, there's forgiveness. There is eternal life. And then he reminds the disciples, you are witnesses of all these things. We also are witnesses of Jesus. We didn't get to see him physically, but as he works in our lives, we are witnesses of what he do, does. And we'll come back to that, just bringing that up. And now he says, I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Jerusalem was a place where most of these major events happened between his death and Pentecost when he sent the Spirit in Acts 2. In Acts, we go a little bit further here, and this is just telling the story, kind of a little later, but as the beginning of the story of the church. Luke was the whole story of all of Jesus' teaching until he left. Acts begins, and it takes up right at that point. In my first book, I told you Theophilus, that was a friend of Luke's. Luke is the writer. He's the, he's the one who went along with Paul. About everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after his chosen apostles, giving his apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. So here we have a general description of what Jesus talked about. Pretty much two subjects. One, he kept proving he was actually alive. Just before the first passage we read, he says to Philip and the other disciples, see, here's the scarves. Here's the hole in the side. It's really me. I'm the one who was killed. But I'm very much alive. And I can eat. Yes, I'm immortal, and I have a different body that can come and go in a way that you can't but I'm real, I'm alive. And he talked about the kingdom of God because now all that teaching he did about the way people should live to be like Christ, he wanted them to put that together and he wanted them to realize that God actually had a lot more to do than the few things he had done while Jesus was here. And he, Jesus tells his disciples, you're gonna do much more than I ever did. Jesus was in one place at one time. How many believers are there today? <coughs> Millions and perhaps a billion? Think of how many places they're doing ministry, multiplying the effects of what Jesus did. And the Holy Spirit is in each one of them, so his presence covers the earth. The kingdom of God will end with us being with Jesus. Both God and Jesus are stated in the New Testament to want to be with us, the whole point of making people in the first place was that he would have those that would be with him that he could fellowship with. And that's a very key part of this eternal life. You know, we're, we're with Jesus and God, the one who saved us. And it reminds us again that, you know, I want you to stay in Jerusalem because there's going to be this event about the Holy Spirit. So I wanted to talk just very briefly about this. You can read John 14 to 16 for yourself. It's, it's three chapters. It, it's not just about the coming of the Spirit, but that keeps popping up throughout the time. And there's five things we want to remember. What was the Spirit going to do? Why was it so important for Jesus to leave so the Spirit could come? 
One thing is that the Spirit could be in each one of the believers, and Jesus was one single person. And so now, in a very special way, God is in us, and in that way, Jesus is in us, and God is in us, and we are in Him. There's a whole being with God part of being with the Spirit. And so here, that's in, in the first point, He's going to be our helper. And there's kind of two parts, comfort and counselor that are in that word. He's going to lead into all truth. He's going to counsel us as to what the truth is, but he's also going to be in us, comforting us. Jesus was with disciples, and they found that a great comfort. When he told them he was going to leave, it keeps saying they were troubled. They were worried. They were grieving this time. They were unsettled. That changed. He's going to be our interpreter. When the Father sends the Advocate, He will teach you everything and remind you what I've told you. He's going to remind us of, of what Jesus meant by those words. Those words aren't just meant to be words taken any way we want. Those words have meaning, and the Holy Spirit will help us to make sure we understand the correct meaning and, and get reminded sometimes simply that, you know, all of a sudden this verse pops in your brain just when you need that thought. It's not by accident. The Holy Spirit's in you. It helps for us to put those verses in there in the first place, though. He's going to be a witness. This has already been mentioned uh, in Sunday school, I think. Yeah, I found several things in Sunday school kind of were pointing at this kind of thing. I will send you the Spirit of truth. He will come from the Father and will testify all about me. That's what Jesus had done, and now the Holy Spirit does it, right? Jesus came to reveal who the Father was. He says, everything I tell you and everything I do is the things that God has told me to do and to say. The Spirit's going to continue that. But notice it's getting passed on. You must also testify about me. The disciples were also to testify. And we get a little further into the section, we're going to find that actually that's us too, because we're the disciples that follow the disciples, right? Verse 5 explains, you know, I have to go away. Yeah, you're grieving. But I've got to go away because then the Holy Spirit's going to come. This is a very important part of God's plan. The Holy Spirit's also the prosecutor. This is kind of his role in the world. Like we're looking at his role in us as believers, but this is his role in the world. He is going to convict the world of its sin. That was much of what the law was supposed to do for the Israelites. Convict them that this is what sin is. Here's the definition. This is what sin is. And of God's righteousness. This is how holy God is and why he asks you to be like him, holy like him. Why the whole system of sacrifices there was to remind them they were not holy like God was. And we'll tell you what he's heard. Uh, pardon me, and of the coming judgment. And so he's reminding people there comes a time when whether you said yes to God or you said no to God, which is equivalent to rebelling, is going to reap the consequences. Reward or punishment. And he's a revealer. He will guide you into all the truth. And just like Jesus, he doesn't speak on his own, but he reveals what he has heard. This is the God head speaking to us as one. He will even tell you about the future. And we find that some of the authors of the New Testament told us more about the future than Jesus has done. And sometimes he, he lets us in on something that's going to happen so that we can respond to it right. Everything belongs to the Father. Little, little short teaching on the Holy Spirit, but we, we get to see how important he is because I, I want to draw something out of that importance. Verse 6 is kind of weird, but very true to life. When the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And the, the apostles did things like this, like, who's the most important was one of their discussions. And they would do that right before, right after Jesus had discussed something very important. And they got totally off track, and Jesus would go, you don't, don't get it. It's not about who's the most important. It's about being a servant and doing what God wants you to do. And so here he basically does the same thing. They wanted to know, is Israel going to be free? Are we going to have a physical nation? Is there going to be a political change in Israel? And Jesus just says, you know what? That's not what you're about. That's not what I'm about. God knows the times. 
And only the Father has the authority to set those dates. And they're not for you to know. You're not going to get an answer to this question about what's going to happen to Israel in this way. But you as disciples will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Just making sure it's up there. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He's saying this in a different way. Jesus said, the scripture says that in, in, in the authority of his name, the message of salvation will go out to the whole world after he's gone. This is telling the disciples, you're going to be part by witnessing to tell people about me everywhere. And what's the story of Jesus? It's the story of him coming to save people, to bring them forgiveness and eternal life. And you're going to do it where? You're going to start at home. Then you're going to go to Judea, a little bit south of Jerusalem. And you're going to go to Samaria, north of Jerusalem and to the outermost parts of the world, to the ends of the earth. It's going to go everywhere. And in Revelation and other places in the book, we read that his name, there are going to be people praising him from every single part of the world. This is wrapped up by Luke in both sections by talking about his leaving. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken away from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. It's a short event. There's three verses there and a couple verses here. And in a few other places it's referred to that Jesus left for heaven. A few little details. There's clouds involved. And there's clouds involved in his coming. He goes to heaven. Where's heaven? We don't have a place as such, and yet it, we always think of it as up somehow. But we do know when a new earth is made at the end, when the old earth is destroyed, the earth and the heavens are going to come together. That new city, the mansion for all the believers on the new earth, is also going to be joined by heaven. And heaven is the place of the real tabernacle, the real holy of holies, the place where God dwells. And he is going to come and dwell with us. These are going to merge. We'll see a tree of life, etc. There's little details like that, if we think hard enough, that are probably going to be involved after the return and in the new eternal life. What a message of hope. He's going to return. We're still waiting, but he's going to return. And that's mentioned over and over again in the rest of the New Testament. That's the prophecy we're waiting for, right? That one does not have an F with it, a fulfill. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. But that eternal life, that life with Christ, is already happening because the Holy Spirit's in us. We've begun eternal life. We shouldn't be sitting around waiting and going, well, it's going to start someday. No, no, no. When we are worshiping God and singing, when we are reading his word and understanding what he wants us to do, that's part of eternal life now. We're getting to know God. That's a big deal. So they worshiped him and then returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy. First time Luke loses the word worship. Worship is given to who? When the angels meet the people, what do they say if somebody tries to worship them? Don't do us. That's right. Do us. We're not the ones you worship. It's God you worship, and only God. And so Luke is putting an exclamation point on the fact that Jesus is God. Right here, they worshiped him. And were they grieving and all wondering what was going to happen and unsure? They were filled with great joy. So we have a change in their atmosphere. And then when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts 2, they receive boldness and they move out and they start telling people and people start coming to the Lord in great numbers. What can we learn? I think one of the things that's, that's maybe not 
detail there is the fact that they were to wait until the Holy Spirit came. Their action, their witness, all these things that God had told them to do was supposed to be combined with the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So when we think forward, we need to think backwards. When God asked people to really move out for him, what did they do first? They first spent time worshiping God and waiting for the Spirit to instruct them on what to do. I think that's one key lesson we can maybe learn out of these verses that's not straightforwardly stated, but it's there by example. We need to work with the Holy Spirit's guidance and with His help and with His power. And that's so illustrated in Acts 2, and 3, and 4 as they come up against, uh, as they go out as a, as a church to preach and as they come against obstacles. Every opportunity, the Spirit gives them an opportunity, they speak, and stuff happens. Good stuff. Like thousands of people come to know the Lord. The beginning of the kingdom just growing. We're going to watch a little bit of a, a video at this point. And uh, this was uh, our day of prayer a couple weeks ago that our, our, our mission has promoted for all of Canada. And you guys were part of it, but you didn't get to see the video. And I was preaching somewhere and I forgot to play the video that day too. So now I get to play it for you. <laughs> the inheritance of Jesus will include a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Many people groups in the world today, however, have yet to receive a gospel messenger. They are people living in darkness. They are without hope and without God in the world. They are the unreached. The majority of the unreached live where most of us will never travel. They are far removed from us economically, politically, and culturally. Yet these are those for whom Christ Jesus has died. Among them will be those whom God will save for his glory. Are we praying that the light of Christ would dawn on those living in the land of darkness? More than two billion have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel. Those identified as the unreached are people belonging to populations with common ethnicity, language and religion, have fewer than 2% evangelical believers. Over one-third of all people groups in the world are classified as unreached. Pray for increased access to the gospel. Jesus instructed his disciples to pray that the Lord would send more workers into the abundant harvest fields. More workers are needed to bring in the crop which is ripe. Pray that the Lord would raise up messengers to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Pray that these servants would be faithful in making known the glorious riches that are in Christ. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. The church will only see fruit when the Holy Spirit is at work. Pray that God would be working in the hearts of peoples everywhere, revealing to them the truth about his Son. Here's a brief story to encourage you. In the 1970s, Tahir served as a missionary in Northern India. On occasion, he would travel to visit his brother-in-law, a doctor who lived on the other side of the state. While there, Tahir met people who would come seeking medical advice. Among those who came were Toya, a people previously unknown to Tahir. He learned that they had no knowledge of Jesus, but began to pray for them as God laid their need for salvation on his heart. The Lord began directing him to be the answer to his own prayer. When support for his existing ministry was drastically cut, he prayed about how to engage with this group. He and his wife moved closer to the Toya people and began a small Bible school in order to reach them. Several students came to the school from the Toya and met Christ during their studies. When they graduated, they went back to share Christ among their people. A movement began. God has blessed their witness so that among the Toya today, nearly 10% named Christ as their Savior. 
Will we be a generation that pays attention to those with no active gospel witness? Will we be a generation that prays? Now, our next slide, for those of you at home, you won't get to see. Uh, it's just a part of kind of protecting. But you guys here can read where we're talking about today. I'll talk in more general terms. So you can see in the map where the bigger picture fits. And that is uh, the area uh, where our uh, pastor and his wife came with me. The uh, green, dark green and blue arrow are the place where the second person I'm going to speak about comes from. And that's the story in the book, the, the first story in the book. And uh, the first person I'm going to talk about uh, has people both just in the country that you see and just outside the country. He himself is working uh, in the neighboring country, and his whole ministry is in one great big state there, which he hopes to reach by uh, 2030. And one of his leaders is leading the ministry on this country's side of the border, in the plains. It's a, it's a country with a lot of hills um, in the middle is already, like Banff and higher, and at the top, well, they've got the top mountains in the world, so. So here we're gonna talk about this, about this guy called Madan, and his prayer card is out there. Uh, he's actually in the video. And the older man that led him to the Lord, his card's out there too, uh, found his ministry being ended, and he says, Lord, why are you telling me to leave? Well, I'm having a great success with Bible correspondence. It's really going well. And then he got told at his next departmental meeting, actually, we're cutting your department in half because the budget is going to be halved. And he goes, oh, I guess the Lord knew. <laughs> now what? And he took it very seriously at that point. And it was because of a change in that country's rules, and so it was just more difficult to bring money into the country to work. But at that school, there was some Hindu families in the area that said, you know, we, we can see there's a difference in the lives of the young men that come out of this school. And we like that difference. And our son, this guy on the left, he's, he's a bit rebellious at this point in his age. So we're going to send him to that school, even though they believe totally different things than we do. And so Madan went to school. This is about 1980. And he studied. And he even missed some soccer in order to study, which is kind of rare for a young man. Um, but he decided that he was going to study all of the writings of the gods in his area. And there are many writings for a Hindu. And then he was being taught about this, this book called the Bible. And he began comparing. And he'd have to read a lot over here and some over here and a lot over there and some over here because there's many writings. We're, we're told that there's like millions of gods in the Hindu thinking about uh, spiritualists. And one day after a year and a half, he came to his professor and he said, you know, I've studied and I've learned one thing. Every religion, every god, demands that we are killed for our sin. Just a pretty blunt statement to make. Uh, but it, it reveals kind of depression that comes when you, you don't have a way out. We know there are beings, and even in the stories about beings, they demand that sin get taken care of, but they don't have a way. But he says, I discovered there's only one person who has a way. A way out. We just read it, right? Jesus provided forgiveness for sins to those who repent. And he discovered that truth. And he said, I will become a Christian. He would change his worship to God because he had discovered this was the one that really brought forgiveness and life. And so in the 25, 30 years since, over 25,000 of his people have come to know the Lord. He was the first. Another half a dozen or dozen followed him from that same school, and he has worked with them. 
And there are now over 60 churches and over 200 house churches, a house church is people up to 25, in his area that know the Lord. His people were a downtrodden people. They were counted as slaves. In Nepal, they, uh, they actually were uh, made slaves and freed in, two th in 2012. And so this part of Asia was not kind to them. They got moved back and forth. They got given the malaria fields. Like, you go live with the malarial mosquitoes. And God granted them resistance. So they've actually thrived in that area. This leader on the right is Kishan, and he is on the northern side of the border there. And he was interpreting me the last time when I, I was teaching Timothy to the, the two groups. They came together for a meeting. Uh, they live in a land that's tough to live in, um, especially where Madan lives. Uh, they try to have a church conference at a tourist resort because that's the place where they're least spied on. Because their neighbors like looking at who's coming into town, who is spreading the gospel, and seeing what they can do to stop them. So this was in a tourist area where they could bring both countries together and we could teach with 60 of their leaders and uh, just lay forward the, the, the word of the Lord because it's in the teaching of the word that they can reach the people. And they don't get much chance for training. Uh, Madonna's had some training, Kishan has had some training and maybe 10 other leaders, but most of them are trained through the efforts of their own leaders. And when we come and teach for three days, like on a whole book with three people teaching different things, uh, it's very helpful. So that is what we do, we have seminars that we impart what we have learned, and uh, we gain so much from them in the way that they treat life uh, and how they make God number one and are bold in the face of persecution. So we, we are encouraged, and they're encouraged and taught, and the Holy Spirit uses both of that to help us with our churches in Canada and then with their churches and reaching those unreached peoples. There are over eight different unreached peoples around Madan's area. And now that they've reached a good core of their own people, they're beginning to send people to work with uh, that community there and that community there. So when you pray for Madan, you are praying for someone who is reaching the unreached in his area. So that's kind of part of the prayer for the unreached in a way. You pray for those reaching them. Just a little bit, this would be a conference and uh, the pastor that was with me decided to let them do some group work this time. Uh, it's not always possible space-wise, but it was here. We get to meet with them around breakfast and, and breaks. And uh, those that have enough English to dare talk to us will talk to us and we will, we will find out some of their thoughts. It was interesting, even just comparing styles. There was a young man and, and an older man, and, and the one in the picture actually, and his wife. And I just said, so how are you finding the sessions? Well, good. Well, that was good. But then I wanted to just kind of find out whether our styles made a bit of a difference. So I said, so which of the two speakers do you enjoy most? That was really funny. <laughs> the youngest one enjoyed the oldest of us, that wasn't me, and the older one enjoyed me who was a little bit younger. So then I knew this is good, this is what we want. We want to have a bit of variety so we can hit each person where they are. So it was a very good response to that, you know, seemingly innocent question, right? And, and of course, I'm standing right there, so for him to say he enjoyed the other one more is a little bit of a challenge to say. Uh, that was one of the interpreters at the top, and, and she was learning how to interpret. She does it as a job, but the language you use in the Bible is different. And it was a real challenge for her, but the difference between day one and day two is, as they gave her some guidance was huge, and she, she did it. And, uh, and so that was a real encouragement to her as well. That, that she could have a part in the transmission of the gospel. Here's two of the unreached. I have to get my headset set here. Um, in the place that we stayed, a hotel, there was this young man and the older man. The older man had had a bit of a stroke and had some difficulties, but he was still helping the clientele. And the younger man was was there, and he kept encouraging us to use the Christian greeting instead of the country greeting. We were, we were supposed to go, Jamasi, not Namaste. And we said, well, why are you encouraging us? What, what do you believe? And he said, well, I'm, I'm a Hindu. 
And I just got married to a, to a Hindu three months ago, but I'm still working at this hotel, and we don't know exactly what we're going to do later. But you know how he made sure that he was getting to heaven? Once in a while, he would go to the Muslim place of worship. And once in a while, he would go to the Christian place of worship. And he figured, okay, I'm now pleasing Jesus, and I'm pleasing all the Hindu gods, and I'm pleasing Muhammad. Except that it doesn't work because the truth is one. But that's what he thought. That was his, and the, the taxi driver one day had the same philosophy. And we were just interested that, that they weren't laying their, being able to have a place of eternity on, on one truth. They were kind of saying, well, we're just gonna hit it all and hope, hope we hit the target. So you can pray for that. Just, just pray for the guy at our hotel. Here's the other one, the one in the book, Philemon. He's in the central part of that country we showed you. He and his wife uh, both have had a long-standing ministry. They've been in the public eye, uh, having been granted the ability to have both radio and the one evangelical television program in their land for the last 10 years. This is sort of unheard of, but it happened. Um, in this time of COVID, what they're doing on the right-hand bottom here, this is a Bible study. One of the people, Lynn, at, at our office, said, you know, we should, we should have a different non-seminar way of relating to Nepal because it, they, they can't get the people together anywhere. They're stuck in their homes. But what they did is those people invited a bunch of their friends from church and not church to attend. They provided the music. Samuel's a very good singer, and so they would be teaching the songs of that country. And then somebody from this country... And then got all their friends who didn't really know about the mission well and didn't know our friends very well to take turns giving a devotional. So they all got to know and pray for these people in their country. And so we're still ongoing. It, it was weekly for three months, and now it's monthly. But people over here are learning about so they can pray for these people, and these people are worshiping with us. So we're worshiping on Zoom from two countries halfway around the world. So that's kind of neat. This is what their capital city looks like. Lots of houses, lots of apartments. Their little church isn't that big. You can see it behind the van there. But this is the inside. And they can get a lot of people in a small building. How would you guys like to sit for a couple hours on the floor? <laughs> yep, even the older ones. Uh, so that's, uh, they do give a chair if you really need it, but uh, that's a rarity. So this is worship in their country. At one of our conferences, I went inside at lunch. I like to take my camera and just talk to people and, and take pictures during lunch times. Um, and I found this man teaching a bunch of boys. He took verses from the Bible and taught them a song to go with it. So they could be teaching their churches how to sing new songs as they grew up and became worship leaders. That's quite a ministry, isn't it? Who are the unreached in this country? Well, there's the lady by the bus stop. It was not COVID, by the way. That was to keep you the dust out in motorcycle rides. On that, on that road, you need to have dust protection. My cameras, I've got two of them that were ruined by the dust on that road. Here, we're on a highway. And where he's sitting is still flat. And if you go 10 feet that way, his floor, you can see through it, 10 or 20 feet. And he's got maybe 20 or 30 foot posts at the back of that little 10 foot room. It's on the side of a hill. He doesn't know Christ probably. She doesn't know Christ probably. In the 60s and 70s, there, you, you could count the Christians in this country like this. In the 70s, maybe it would take you three. Philemon had an uncle, and Philemon's father was actually teaching people and bringing them to worship the gods in the backyard, Hindu gods. And his uncle got sick, and he went to a hospital that happened to have Christian nurses and doctors. And he got saved there. It took him several months to get healed, and he came back with New Testaments, telling his uh, neighbors. And Philemon believed, and his father believed. 
And it's quite a story about how they got baptized because it took them like a week to make a journey to get baptized, okay? Does any of you have to take a, a week's journey out of your country to get baptized so you won't get put in jail? The baptizer got six years. You only got one year for being baptized. Pretty dangerous times. Anyway, that's the beginning of Philemon's ministry. And he, he went into preaching in his teens. It's quite a story. You'll have, you'll have to read the book to get more. My call to missions came somewhere around the age of 10 with a missionary from uh, another land, uh, one of these two lands, who said, you need to pray and see what God's got you to do because he's got a mission. We just read about it, right? His name, in his name, this message about repentance should go to all the countries in the world. In his name, it should go to the outermost parts of the, of the world. How's it going to get there? The video kind of told you, right? They've got to hear. They've got to believe. Somebody's got to get sent. And so we are partnering with those that are reaching their own country. Our partners all have a mission in their own country. And we are helping them to do more by coming alongside of them. Prayer is number one. But monetary support is also given. And on our website, you can see how to do that, either whether it's supporting me or supporting them. Jesus says, oh, will you help this man? I forgot. So I prayed. And I'm a, I'm a Mennonite, and we don't talk about visions, but that's what I got. <laughs> and there, here's this young man and this voice from the other side that says, will you help this man? It's a very short message, but I got the point because what I've been praying, what's my part in missions? He says, you're going to help this man. It took me like 45 to 50 years before I met him at school and could identify who it was. I tried in the meantime to find who this was, and... and it didn't work. I, I tried up north. I tried other ways. But when he came, I, I, I recognized he was different right away. And both my wife and I were introduced to him. And we eventually told him, we think you're the person God has asked us to help. He joined the mission. And then we became a full-time part of the mission. And so I ended up being able to help him in his faraway country. Uh, it's another Southeast Asian country. But to all of us, Jesus says... Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing and teaching them to obey. That's to all of us, whatever part we can have. He says, you shall be my witnesses from home to the ends of the earth. And Romans 10 says, be a part of the process. Any part of that process of sending and making sure the message is heard, that's up to you. So I ask you, will you be a part of Jesus' team helping build a kingdom? Wherever Jesus puts you, where someone has not heard or not understood, or where someone needs encouragement to grow in Christ, or someone to come alongside of them to carry out their part of this teamwork, will you help? Where there's a chance to witness in life, word, and or action, will you do it? And especially in praying, 